Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. We have today Rick Sasari. This is part two. We had so much that we covered, and there's so much more to cover. And Rick is back, so I'm really appreciative. He's gracious to join us again. You know, who's he's one of the legends and pioneers of direct response marketing with his many successful infomercials. He's helped sell more than two billion dollars worth of product and launched over 30 brands, including Sonicare, OxyClean. George Foreman Grill, Juice Man, GoPro Camera, and many more. He's the author of Buy Now, and as I describe it, like I said, he turns helps turn great products into $100 million companies and household names. Rick, thanks for coming back. Hey, good morning. It's great to see you again. Um, and you know, where we left off was we talked about the, some of the great stories and journey and lessons from the Juice Man Juicer that it grew to 160 employees, $75 million mm -hmm. a year, and... I wanted to pick up where we left off about some of the successful campaigns after that and the steps that worked that made them successful. So what was after the Juice Man Juicer? Yeah, let me just go back to the Juice Man and if, yeah. and, and if this is a, a little bit repetitious, go I ahead. apologize, but probably one of the biggest lessons I learned through the whole Juice Man uh, campaign was, was twofold. Um, one was the concept for me of uh, synergy in marketing. And what I mean by that is, you know, you can have an infomercial and at the time we were doing infomercials, we were doing live seminars, um, we, we layered in public relations and when all these things start to work together, it, it creates a synergy where the, the value is like, you always hear that saying like two plus two equals six. And that, that was one of the less biggest lessons I took away from mm -hmm. the, the juice man was try to, how to combine, um, different types of direct-to-consumer marketing where they worked together and created a, a, a bigger sum of the total than, than each would do individually. Do you find that, Rick, there's a part that a lot of people miss out on that they just don't do, that's low-hanging fruit for them, that because they're just doing other stuff that they don't you know, kind of choose one of those type of, of marketing? Yeah, I think, I think some uh, people always have a tendency um, to do what's comfortable. And, are, and and what I mean by comfortable is what they have a knowledge of or, or an area that they're comfortable in. And they should be exploring all different avenues of marketing. And every time you do a, a, a marketing campaign, I always you always learn something new because you're getting constant feedback from the customer. You try something, it doesn't work. You know, you always talk about, um, you know, you learn more from your failures than from your success right. because you, you, you've tried things, it doesn't work, you try something new. But I, I do believe it makes sense to, even if you're successful in one avenue of marketing, to explore different avenues because I've always found that um, there's always more that you can do on any campaign. Mm -hmm. So then what was next after the Juice Man for you? Well, after the Juice Man, um, just you know, quickly from a, you know overall standpoint is we sold that business to a company called Salton uh, Housewares based in Chicago. Yeah. And um, locally, there was a, a company that was just starting up uh, called Optiva Corporation. And I was living in Seattle and Bellevue is kind of the newer section of uh, there's Bell, you know, Bellevue in Seattle. That's where Microsoft is located, all that. But anyway, um, this company had, um, was interested in the success of how we marketed the Juice Man because it was a consumer, basically a consumer appliance. Yeah. And even though it was a little bit different category, Sonicare was a consumer appliance. And they called me and, and um, wanted to basically come in and use the same type of marketing model that we did. Right. And Optiva Corporation basically was the, you know, the, the makers of the Sonicare toothbrush. Right. And it was real, you know, I could talk for hours about that because it was um, such a cool product. Uh, but basically, just a quick background, it yeah. was developed at the University of Washington and they do a technology transfer. And um, one of the periodontists that helped develop it uh, came over and did the science part of it. And then David Giuliani, who who had a background in manufacturing, is a great businessman. He he ran you know ran the operations, and a, and a guy named Eric Meyer was the marketing person there. And um, that you know the challenge that Sonicare had, and I think I mentioned this in the first part of our interview, was that it was a hundred fifty dollar toothbrush, right. and it was a new product. And they were having really difficult time getting it in any kind of retail distribution uh, because if you saw this in a box on the shelf and you had no idea what it did, 
how how why would a person want to buy it so mm -hmm. this was the perfect product to do a half hour infomercial for mm -hmm. and i've always believed in um selling through education and so what we did is made a show that educated the consumer about uh gum disease uh what it would do from a health standpoint and then how you could fix it and the benefit of the sonicare is being able to destroy the bacteria beyond the reach of the bristles in the hard to reach areas mm -hmm. and once consumers understood that it started flying off the shelves and like any of these um, different campaigns we're going to talk about it, I always refer to the snowball effect it starts really small you, you work really hard in the beginning it, people start to hear about it they tell their friends that you're layering on the marketing and it gains a momentum and and then you start to see the really fast growth and one of the you know the highlights of the Sonicare thing was um, Oprah uh, voted it one of her favorite products, and once that happened, it just went. Psh, oh, it's huge! You know, one of those things, and that's one of those marketing things where a, a good example. You can't start your company and think, "Let's." And I and this is a mistake people make all the time, especially when it comes to PR. They go, "Oh, let's get it on Oprah, and then we'll be a success." Okay, you don't come out of the gate <laughs> and do that. We we were like beating the bushes for a couple years, yeah. getting at local talk shows, th things like that. And then a producer from Oprah sees it and, and they try it. And yeah. I remember Oprah saying about it, it, it makes my gums hum or something when she used it. And, and then it just, you know, that was just one, one milestone. Yeah. In the, but, but it was, it was a fun, fun thing. So. What do you think tipped it to get it actually on Oprah for you? Um, you know, that's hard to say because it, it wasn't like we reached out from a PR standpoint. I think at that point the company was doing uh, 50 or 60 million in sales. It was starting to get traction, awareness, and it was every and it was just one of those things where I think the PR company sent it in and there was enough um, news about the product that yeah. that that it made sense for her to try it. So Yeah. Yeah, and I'm smart. I'm and, no, and with Oprah it's like, you know, if she doesn't like it, she's not going to talk about it, right. it, you know. So What did the initial conversation look like when they contacted you and your decision making to take it on or, or not take it on and you know yeah that's a great question because um that that still is relevant to today um when i look at products and i really look at the product and see if it's something that i like and i'll use in my home mm -hmm. and everything that you've mentioned before we we still use in our house yeah. we have you know three sonic yeah. toothbrushes totally, yeah yeah, exactly. And so that's really a big decision for me because, you know, you always hear about and, and it's absolutely true, you know, work on something that you're passionate about and it's not not really work. And, you know, if you're, you know, building a career and doing a single product or whatever. But for me, I, I kind of do that. I see a lot of products. And if I personally can't get excited about it or don't believe in the product, I I pass on it. So to answer your question, the first thing was I, I, I tried it. I love the product. I saw the benefit and I could get excited about it. And if I do that, then I can get really get behind it. Yeah. And when you're talking to these companies, do you always require a stake in the company? Because you're putting a lot of your time and energy in. Actually, that's something very smart. Uh, and uh, I didn't I didn't start off doing that, but I, I pretty much do that now. And be, because really, um, I can point to a track record and say, here's where your sales are. Um, and it's based on a performance. If we don't get it to a certain level, then, then, then no, but yes, um, that's something that we, we like to do whenever possible. And do you get a lot of pushback from the company with that? Because, you know, on one hand you can raise their sales, but they're thinking it's their baby and they started it from like six years ago. What yeah, how, and I'm it, wondering how that initial conversation goes. Yeah, exactly. And it really depends where they are in their cycle. And, yeah. and um, you know, with the Sonic Care, it was the very beginning and they were in a fundraising thing. And a lot of times we come in at that stage and they are looking, we can trade, sometimes trade services for equity. There's different ways of structuring it. It yeah. really depends. If something's fairly established, like you deal with a, any type of Fortune 500 company and there's you know no back end no role, that type of thing I and I just prefer dealing with new newer companies we talked a little bit more it's hard it's always harder with startups that have never done any marketing we like to come in after there's a little bit of traction and track record and that's where we've had our best success and that's also a good time where you can uh, you know get some equity yeah so Rick you bring on Sonic here you decide this is a great product I'll mm -hmm. use it my family will use it so what do you do next 
to help help get them the next level? Well, you know, um, back when we did that one, we we were coming off of really what worked for the Juice Man, and it really wasn't any big strategic thinking. I'm just being really honest with you. It yeah. was like, okay, let's duplicate the model that worked for the for the Juice Man. We were selling that. Again, with the juicing, it was an education process, the benefits of getting more fruits and vegetables in their diet. What are the health benefits of that? And we took that very same approach with the Sonicare. And basically, um, again, the benefit of the 30-minute infomercial in that particular case is we had a, enough time to explain it. And so we, we start off every project very, very similar, similarly. We um, sit down with the appropriate people in the company. Usually it's a small company and it's the founders, the management, the marketing people. Mm -hmm. And, and it, you know, it might be anywhere from one to six people at the most. And we do an all-day kind of brainstorming session, just really learning about the product, mm -hmm. um, what successes they've had, what failures they've had, um, you know, just trying to really learn what the unique um, selling proposition is for that particular product yeah. so we can emphasize that. And then I like to go out, and I think we, we talked a little bit about this before, is the, w the big thing with Sonicare, they were having a dental convention down at the Moscone Center in San Francisco. All of the top periodontists and dentists from around the country were there. Sonicare had a booth. And we were able to go around and talk to all these people and interview them. Yeah. And that was kind of the basis for making the, the show. Because for me, it was an education process, actually learning about gum disease, right. how to treat it, what the current treatments were, and why Sonicare right. would be better. You know so. too much, more than you care to know about gum disease, I'm sure, yeah, exactly. at that point. Yeah. So then what did you find with that research? What was some big breakthroughs that you used in the actual infomercial? Yeah, and and really it um, with, uh, again, not to go into a lot of detail about gum yeah. disease, but it's yeah. really, you know, uh, again, my uh, my background was never in marketing. It was I have a bio biology degree and always science-based. Right. So it's another, when you ask about what products I like to work with, if there's some type of connection to health, to yeah. science, nutrition, that type of thing, and really learning and understanding the cause of dumb, gum disease and the, and the bacteria and how the sonic care could help do that. And then it was really funny in this particular project, because this goes back uh, along, uh, you know, I think it was 1995 when we were working on this, uh, obviously a long time ago. Um, but you see 3D animation all the time now. Well, back then it was just kind of in the infancy stage and the computer um, uh, technology. Yeah. We we had to build a uh, 3D animation of how the Sonic Care worked. And um, once we pushed the button to start it rendering, it actually took two weeks to render uh, like a uh, minute and a half animation. Wow. And you know, today you just kind of do that instantly. But really, that that brings up a good point. Um, you see animation used a lot in um, uh, in these types of shows and, and really all videos. And it's a really powerful tool because it deliver it's usually used to deliver a complicated message very simply. And people have a tendency, this is just kind of a marketing thing, to really believe in animation because I think they're taught to as growing up, watching TV, that type of thing. They see that that type of thing, and and they just for whatever reason believe it. I'm not saying the animation is is dishonest. It isn't. It's it's right. just a simplified version yeah. of trying to make something complicated very simple simplified by pictures. And it's usually an, an important component, and that's why you see it in a lot of uh, shows and commercials. So, what did that animation look like so we can visualize it? What was it? Uh... Yeah, basically just showing it started out um, basically. Um, showing uh, a wide shot of the mouth and it zooms in to the teeth and then the pockets between the, the teeth and then really zooming in like like magnifying what they call the dental pockets. If any of you have been to the dentist where they measure, they right. probe, they measure the pockets, yeah. well, that's where the bacteria forms. Yeah. And so we had to go into the pocket and then we, you know, then the animator, what does a bacteria look like? Who You, you know, and so right. something squiggly and ugly, you know. <laughs> uh, so it zooms in, you see that. And then, and then a, a, the head of the Sonicare would come in, and it, and you basically, it, it, it works by um, what they call a, a, another scientific term, cavitation, where it, it, it creates a activity with liquid that, that actually goes in, and, um, and, it, and it creates a bubbling 
Right. Uh, yeah, I, I can picture the, the bubbles yeah, going yeah, in. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's what goes in and, and yeah. disrupts the bacteria and actually cleans those pockets out. And a regular toothbrush doesn't have the ability to do that. Now, you can't just go out and say this. Um, the benefit of working with a company like Sonicare is they had done clinical trials. So you can go in and actually make a health claim because they had spent the money and done the science right. to prove that it, it had this, the ability to clean beyond the bristles. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, again, at the time, that's more innovative. What made you even decide to do an animation like that? Really just, to, again, um, knowing that it was a simple way to explain a complicated subject mm -hmm. was the big, you know, biggest yeah. reason. Yeah. So how fast did Sonicare grow? You know, they, they were always the fastest growing company I ever worked with until oh. I worked with... Um, the GoPro camera. Um, but they, uh, if I remember the numbers correctly, I started working with them when they were about 3 million in sales. And I think they went from 3 to like 25 oh, huge to thing. like 120 to like close to 200. Wow. And then I stopped counting. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, it, it was it, it was just a, a big a snowball. And then, you know, what's interesting is um, having watched several companies like this, it's really easy. Even if you have a popular product, there's two parts, you know, the marketing that makes it a success. But then on the business side, you have to build a company and a culture that can support that. Right. And um, that's a, that's an area that where, where some companies fall down as well, yeah. you know. Yeah. That's not my forte operations. And mine is more getting the sales in the door. Yeah. Yeah, you were mentioning some of that with the juice man. So for the, the Sonicare, what were some of the things that you think created those I mean, those are huge jumps from three yeah. million twenty five. What were some of the things that created those big jumps? And then what were some of the kind of challenges with those big jumps? Yeah, well the challenge is when you're growing uh just and I'll talk from a marketing side and not a operations or personal side, but yeah. um, you know, it's always planning for the growth. Uh, from the standpoint of okay, you have a marketing that works, and from the stand a standpoint, if you spend more media dollars, you know you're going to generate much more revenue. So planning the in the inventory is a huge one. You know, planning that out. Mm -hmm. Sonicare did something very unique, and again, it was the same management team that did the Claire Sonic. They instead of manufacturing in overseas in China, uh, David Giuliani, the the um, CEO of the company, his background was in manufacturing, and they actually manufactured that product in the U.S. They they imported some of the parts, you know, the electric motors, and so that gave them the ability really to control and and growth by ramping up. They didn't have to you know worry about shipping product in from China or wherever, right. and that was kind of one of the secret weapons that both yeah. Sonicare and Clarisonic had is that they did their manufacturing. Right when I say in the U.S., it's not like they hired a factory. They built the manufacturing in the same office that they did the marketing and customer service. It was a you know front office with a warehouse behind, and the manufacturing line was right there. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the big benefits that they can could, could, could control the inventory. Yeah, and, yeah, that is huge. I mean, because someone's thinking, I want to go from three million to twenty-five million to a hundred million. What were yeah. some of the big? Uh, causes for the big jumps. Yeah, and, and you know, it's again, it's a it's a marketing model that's based on direct response television. Yeah. And the key to that is making one of these infomercials that that mm -hmm. works. And when I say work is that this is all right. If you're Procter and Gamble, you have a budget. You can spend ten million on TV advertising. Right. Uh, Sonicare, if they're doing three million in revenue unless they raise uh, a ton of money, which they didn't have, right. and most small companies don't, they can't spend the advertising dollars. Right. So the half-hour infomercial, if you spent a dollar, in, in this particular case, it worked well. If you spent a dollar on TV, you got anywhere from 2 to $3 back. And they took all of the money that was coming in yeah. and put it back into advertising. So in that first big jump, when they grew really quickly, they they spent 7 or $8 million in advertising and so that's that's really the thing that 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 skyrocketed the sales. And then once it starts to create the awareness, the the momentum and the snowball effect, mm -hmm. what the way it grows is the same way. You open up one retailer, uh, you have the TV running, it supports the sales. Then you open up another retailer, and that's how it it it, it really expands very quickly. And again, it's a it's a there's a, pl a lot of places where you can stumble. And so they had a really great management team. Um, 
and we're able to roll it out in retail yeah. at the right time in the right places to to do the growth. Yeah. And, and initially, you know, when they don't have the money for the infomercial, what's the cost of that and how did they even get it produced to, to begin with? Yeah, well, that, that was one where I did a um, entrepreneurial deal where I split the cost of the infomercial with them in return for a royalty on the sales uh, that we did through through TV. And and I, again, it was one where two things. It was a product I loved and a belief in what I could do from a marketing standpoint. And it was very attractive to them being a startup company without much um, cash. And so... Um, because we're in the agency business, we make the show, so our agency made money. We didn't make money making the production. We took a risk on that. Right. But it is a risk. We, yeah, we placed the media buy, so we made money placing the media buy and then also on royalty on sales. So So what did you put in? Obviously the infomercial was wildly successful. What yeah. did you learn? Because I know you said you put it out, you get feedback, you change it. What were some of the things initially that worked and some of the things you had to take out because of what you learned? Yeah, that 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 one, we were really fortunate. Um, when I say really fortunate, it was it was a really good team of people we were working for on the on the front end that had experience in at the time this wasn't a medical device but the the marketing people came from Johnson and Johnson and different and this you know they were recruited to help start up mm. and it was a really smart group of management people and we really spent a huge amount of time on the front end making sure we were doing everything correct and this was one of the few exceptions where the show worked well out of the gate and mm. when that happens uh, when i say out of the gate when we started doing the media test when that happens um, the interesting thing about an infomercial, this is a situation where we really didn't have to go back and tweak it. We were able to run it uh, consistently. But then what happens is maybe six months down the road, your returns start to um, diminish. And so it's really easy to what we call refresh the show mm -hmm. because now you have real users. They ordered it from TV. They love it. You go back, you interview these people, and you and you kind of just update and refresh the show. And, right. and that's kind of the process we use several times with them. Yeah. And you keep... You know, even in the book, you talk about the Sonicare, they had great management. They have fantastic management. What did you see that other people should be doing with their management? Because obviously you've seen a lot of companies that they were doing that made them a great management. Yeah, and, I, and I've worked with um, – and, that, and that's one of the questions too because I get the same question every single time because, okay, if you have the ability to make – sell products, make them successful, um, why don't you invest in our company? And I and you know what? In other words, why don't I do those kind of deals every time? Right. And really, the main um, barrier to doing that is not whether it's a good product or not. It's it's the management team, and that's something where, as a company grows, yeah. I uh, for a marketer, you have very little control over how they manage the right. company, the growth, and that's yeah. kind of a people decision you kind of have to make up front. And that's one of the mm -hmm. reasons why um, we won't do that all the time, even though if it's a if it's a good sure. product. And I don't know, it's, um, you, you know, I just, I love reading books uh, about entrepreneurs who start businesses and make them successful because they just all bring something to the table. It's not always the same thing. Um, it's an, I, I guess, an ability to juggle a lot of different things yeah. successfully and in, in a kind of an analytical ability along with the ability to see the big picture. You know, you never really see, and I'm just exceptions to every rule. A rule, an accountant start a start a successful company because his expertise is like, how do I save money? How do I save money? And they don't have the big picture. Again, there's exceptions, but in general, a big picture vision. And so, there's just certain people that just really mm -hmm. have great entrepreneurial ability, and they had several in that company. Mm -hmm. And you know, the CEO of that company, David Giuliani, he was voted the Small Business Person of the Year. Uh, a couple years in a row and you know I just can't speak highly enough of, of him and his entire management team so yeah. yeah I asked because you know other people if they're looking at maybe they're hiring someone or a team member or investing you saw something you saw some traits in this company because I'm sure you could take five different companies are all doing about the same amount in sales and you saw yeah. something with this team or these people were there any specific traits that stick out to you that you saw this and you knew, I mean, you took a big risk? Yeah. Well, they knew, they, they really knew, 
their product inside and out. They assembled a team. And so I talked about David Giuliani was a CEO. Yeah. He had a manufacturing background. So he covered that whole thing of uh, taking the technology, being able to manufacture it, set up a, a manufacturer, which isn't easy, a, a line of people and the workers and manage that. Eric Meyer was the director of marketing. He he came from the medical device and he had had a successful track record there. Mm. Uh, there was a guy named Mike Stoll who was a CFO who was really great at analyzing the numbers and um, and he was an entrepreneurial CFO mm -hmm. where he wouldn't just look to cut costs. He would say, okay, if I spend a dollar here, I can mm -hmm. make so much. And it was really, I think, uh, all the, the entire team that was impressive to me. And you don't always see that. Again, this, this was a situation where um, they had an idea, they raised some money to start the company, and they brought in really, really good people. And in this case, it wasn't one person. It was the combination of the entire team. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, that's one of the challenges with any entrepreneur, and I've been through it myself, where you're starting and you don't have the funds and it's just you and you have to wear all those hats. Right. And that's why I have the utmost respect for people that start that way and um, are able to be you successful. Yeah. You really have to be good in a lot of different areas to, to, to be successful. So what ended up happening with Sonicare? Or do you... They sold the company to Philips for uh close to half a billion dollars wow yeah amazing it was a big big success story so this may be a dumb question but um was that an easy decision to sell was it a hard decision in the i end? think it was uh, an easy decision i think that um when most people start a business like that they're looking at an exit strategy and what is it? Yeah. We're going to go public. We're going to sell the business. And I really believe that they actually kind of, and, and again, there's investors in the company and the investors like, how am I getting my money out? Yeah. So I think it was a fairly easy decision yeah. when the opportunity came around. They, it was interesting. You learn a lot, a lot about, um, uh, for lack of a better word, corporate warfare. Uh, when Sonicare was stealing market share, they had some big legal battles with Braun, and Braun is a big company mm. that basically used the technique of we're going to sue you to, to divert focus, wow. resources, things like that to keep you from growing. And it was interesting going through that. I mean, I didn't get involved in the legal part. I was the marketing, but watching it all, all happen. And I think that they could have sold the company sooner than they did um, if, if those kind of things didn't, didn't happen. And then they did something really amazing. Um, there, there was a um, defect in one of the um, potential defect in, in, in the electric handle one time, and they did a recall, and they basically recalled, I don't know how many units, 100,000 or whatever, wow. and pulled them all back, gave everyone new units. I mean, it's just like really expensive for the company, but the absolute right thing to do that yeah. just kind of furthered, cemented, um, that, you, that the, you can trust this product, you can trust this company, and we stand behind it. Mm-hmm. And so did they reach out to these companies to sell it or did the Philips come to them? Um, I think they started reaching out. Um, and what happened is as they got larger and this happens in, in, you know, there's an entrepreneurial phase. They brought in, um, a, pr a president, a new president to run the company that had, um, you know, experience running 100, 200, 300 million dollar companies right. and, and the new president they brought in actually um, had connections um, with Phillips and so that's yeah. kind of opened the door for it. Yeah. So what do you what did you see the different skill set is when you bring a CEO who's used to to running a hundred million dollar company as opposed to, you know, twenty five? What did it, what do they bring to the table that's different? That's a good question because um, that's I'm usually um, my my role at that point is it's really reduced yeah. and it's more um uh i guess organizational structure and oper operational mm. structure and it's it's at that point you know when you're past the to me almost the 10 or 15 million dollar you you start to then have layers of management and organizational charts 
And those are all the things that I, I uh, don't get excited about. <laughs> you like about. the marketing, yeah. yeah. So as soon as, as soon as they start bringing in yeah. the extra layers of management, and it's not it's necessary. You have to do it. It's just that that's not my favorite time. Mm-hmm. In, in, you like that startup growth phase. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, what, so, Rick, what are some of the big marketing lessons that you learned from Sonicare, from working with Sonicare? Um. You know, I think it, it, it reinforced um, something that I mentioned before that you can be very, very successful selling a product by educating the consumer um, instead of trying to sell. Um, I know it sounds a little funny, but um, it's really it, it you somebody buys somebody would buy the product because they really understood the benefit of what it would do for them. And it wasn't a fake claim like, oh, buy this, you'll have whiter teeth. It was, look at, if you understand the the science behind why this works, mm-hmm. why wouldn't you use it? Mm-hmm. And and that's, um, you know, kind of a common theme in a lot of the successes mm. that, that, that we've had. And really just, you know, going back and if – um, instead of making up like a strategy of like, oh, what are the what are the benefits of Sonicare? What does it do? Well, you know, whiter teeth and brighter smile. It, I, again, I lean towards the science part of it mm-hmm. and really understanding and um, educating the consumer what the real benefit of the product was. And then it really wasn't like you're. Um, it's kind of a common sense decision to purchase the product. Yeah, yeah. So really dig deep into why it works. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So then after Sonicare, there's a, there's a huge exit there. Mm-hmm. What do you do next? Well, at that time, we started to gain momentum. Um, I, I mentioned when we sold the Juice Man business, I took some time off. But then the Sonicare thing happened. And then that's kind of how, uh, again, right now, I, I the company is very direct. You can call it an ad agency. I like to call it a marketing company. Yeah. We... Th- our own business started to snowball. Okay, we had a couple successes. People started coming to us um, to do projects, and I I didn't initially have a plan to start a marketing company or an agency. It just be it just one of those things that kind of happened, and I enjoyed doing it. Mm-hmm. And so um, we we just started because of the success of the Sonicare. People, other people started coming to us, and we started hiring a staff and. Um, building out more of the company that we are today mm-hmm. so so what was the next uh product that you decided to work right, so with? The, next, the next one that came right on the heels of after the doing the sonic care and again this the, a lot of th- um these projects happen in parallel the the sonic care got launched but then probably six months after the sonic care got launched the um sultan sultan housewares the company we sold the juice man business to they came back to us and said, can you continue to do the type of marketing you were originally doing for the Juice Man, mm-hmm. infomercial, the media buying? Yeah. So again, we started doing that on an agency basis for Salton. And, and they said, oh, we want to try this. They, they were a product developer and they manufacture in China. And they, they had a, a couple products that they brought to us, uh, too. And they said, we want you to try making these infomercials for these two products. And one was a homemade bagel maker. And the other one was a countertop grill. Okay. And um, we – here's an example where we looked at the bagel maker and said we, we don't think that's – why it's a cool product. We don't think it's a good idea yeah. because someone can just go down to the corner store and buy bagels. It, you know, it just, it just didn't – it was too much work to get to an end product. It was easier to get and cheaper to get somewhere else. Right. Um, and there, and that would always be a kind of a little niche category, but not not a big seller. And the other one was the the countertop grill, which um, what turned out to be the George Foreman grill. But it was a funny story behind it because they had been marketing this product before, and George wasn't endorsing it at the time. And it was it was a taco maker. And the reason that the grill was slanted originally was you'd put your your hamburger or taco meat in there, and the idea was you put it at the edge of the table. And then you'd scrape the meat into a taco shell. Mm. And so they said, you know, and they said, this looks like a good product. People like it, but we're having trouble selling it. And so we said, well, that's kind of a limited market, a taco maker. Why don't you just make it into a grill? And and um, and it was interesting because the original unit um, 
was basically as, as big as like a laptop computer, or no, a little smaller, and you could fit basically perfectly fit four hamburgers on it. Hmm. And um, so we talked about, we had success. One of the things we learned from the Sonicare, um, and, and we don't always do this, but we, we had a, a semi-celebrity at the time, Richard Dysart was a credibility guy. And I liked, and I said, okay, um, who, you know, who can we get to pair up with this? And we knew that cooking hamburgers was a big deal. And it just turned out that George Foreman was in the news because he had, he was 45 years old. He had, you know, had that famous fight with Muhammad Ali in Africa that he had lost. And he went on a downward spiral for 10 years and was out of boxing. And then he just decided to, um, make a comeback and yeah. he, and he actually knocked out Michael Moore, won the heavyweight championship. And so people started writing about what did you do from the time in Africa till the fight with Muhammad Ali till you won it again. And he just talked to, you know, he, he had ballooned, he went out, he ate hamburgers every day. He, he got like 320 pounds. And so it was really an amazing comeback story. And he was the oldest one to win the heavyweight camera. So we thought it might be a good fit. And so we reached out to his agent. And again, he wasn't having any endorsements at the, at the time, very few. Right. And, um, the CEO of the company, Leon Dryman, made a deal with him that was a profit sharing deal. For every grill they sold, he'd get X, you know, similar to a royalty, but X dollars based on the margin in the in the grill. Right. And um, funny story, when we made the uh, infomercial for this, we had used the grill ourselves, um, and it worked really well. It just cooked food. It, it cooked it twice as fast. It, it was juicy. It, it was just, a, it was one of those products that was just a good product and right. totally different. There's not a lot of science behind, you know, Sonicare, there's a health, you know, science, health story, right. juicer, there's a nutrition story. This is a grill. So what, okay, so what does a grill do, do, do well? It did a couple things. One, we had a segment in the show where we cooked five different um, types of meat and and we put the time a timer up, and it was it was like you can cook a pork chop this fast, and a hamburger this fast, and a steak this fast, and um, and we lined them up like that. And in a second, and the, really the key thing in this, and two key things was people really loved George Foreman, and they loved his story. And every time he would take a bite of food, they they would uh, order the product, and we we learned that from QVC. But really, the key, really the key thing was tying in a little bit of his boxing with what was happening with the grill when you cook the hamburgers the the grease would run out and we zoom the camera in and just um you could see the grease coming off away from the food and deli you know um we came up with the tagline knock out the fat mm -hmm. and um you know tying the boxing in and so it was a faster way to eat and you know, we never did any scientific studies, but we were saying it was a healthier way to eat because you were draining fat away. I don't know if that's true or not, um, but it, the perception makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. You're not; it's not sitting. And then we would show, like, okay, if you cooked a, a hamburger on a stovetop in a frying pan, we would show, we'd let the the, the fat congeal, and you'd you'd, you'd see all this <laughs> and fat. Whereas this way, all you're removing the fat, right. and so that that coupled with um, George, and then the the funny part in making the show is. We, 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 you, you talk about a lesson we learned. We said, okay, George is famous for boxing. We had a big ro a boxing robe, knock out the fat. He came on the set. We bought time from um, footage of the fight from HBO. I think we paid $15,000 for a five or 10 second clip where we mm -hmm. knocked out Michael Moore. And that's, and, we, and that's how we introduced George in the show and we showed the clip. And this is a show where we rolled out and not rolled out we did a media test and the results were terrible hmm. and we and fortunately the the company said well what can we do and so we said okay who's the going to be the primary buyer of this and we knew a little bit about infomercial buyers we knew they were mostly women and women don't like boxing uh, right. they, george so so what we did is we took out the boxing footage focused more on the food we actually um trying to think we um, that we did lower the price. It was seventy nine dollars, and we lowered it to fifty nine dollars. And the second time we rolled the show out, making these changes, uh, little tweaks, all of a sudden the the numbers went off the the charts. And, and you know, I was talking before about Sonicare, a dollar, and you get two dollars back. Here, if you spent a dollar on media, you'd get three, four, or five dollars wow. back. So that that this just like took off. Yeah. It was. It, it was amazing. And, and the benefit of working with a company like Sultan was 
they they were retailers. They weren't direct marketers. So we handled all the direct marketing. But what they were able to do is basically roll this product out at 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 retail and had yes. all those connections. And that's how that and that one I don't know the 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 sales figures, but I know at one point this was ten years ago they sold twenty million units and. Mm. Um, I think they hit a billion dollars and so just on that one product. But what, what was in, also interesting on that was um, they usually people will reduce the price to sell the product. And we did that initially, but we were just exploring the initial price point. What they did was they took a four hamburger grill and then they made a six hamburger and an eight hamburger. So instead of lowering the price, we kept raising the price. Eventually, they had a backyard grill that was 150 You know what I mean? Right. And, and it and and it was a really good way of doing product development without eroding the price for the product. Yeah, that is that's remarkable. And um, so, how was it working with George Foreman? George is a great guy. Uh, one other funny story: um, he had had never used a grill when we when we first walked onto the set, and fortunately, we had a good host. And so, George's role was, you know, to basically. Uh, eat. flip a few burgers, yeah. take some bites and, and, yeah. and, but George was really interesting. Here's a guy was the heavyweight champion of the world. And, you know, you see entourages and boxers and, you know, the kind of a shady side of it. George, um, when he went through that 10 year period after the fight in Africa, he became a preacher and he would teach, uh, preach, um, a monthly, uh, not a, a weekly, every Sunday, in downtown Houston where he lived, he would go to church and, and and teach a sermon. So here's a guy who was the heavyweight champ of the world. He traveled around. He had one guy to kind of uh, that he traveled around with that, that helped him out, no entourage, and he was a big family man. Just yeah. uh, the first show we shot in Seattle in a studio, but every subsequent show we said, you know, George was famous for his kids uh, and all his sons named George and his daughters named Georgette. And um, so, <laughs> so that's we went true. to his house in Houston and we actually, you know, got footage of him using it in his kitchen but met him and he's, he's just a great family man with good values and that's that's one of the things i really re respected about about him and just a great guy to work with and then i always remember shaking his hand for the first time your hand just it was like shaking hands with a bear your hand just disappeared inside this huge i could never imagine you know being on the receiving end oh god <laughs> that'd be horrible it's amazing yeah yeah, but kind of a gentle giant. And the other thing I noticed about him was he was very quiet and low key, but then he stepped onto the set and he kind of like flicked a switch and it was a different personality and not, not a fake personality. It just was quiet, reserved in front of the camera. Then he kind of became the bubbly, good natured George. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. People loved his personality. They, yeah. they loved him. He's a warm guy. Well, seems like a warm personality. Mm -hmm. So then the George Foreman grill, what right. was next? Um, Let's see, George Foreman Grill. Um, so the the next, and again, we're just you know taking the bit the big ones. I had done a um, uh, a cleaning product. It was a Seattle-based company called Quick and Bright, and uh, it was an all-purpose cleaner. It was a pink. You could you know you could take a spoon, you could eat the stuff, but it would oh, really? remove everything. And so we had had a successful show on TV, and um, it it did really well. But here it was an example where the management team. I guess wasn't good at taking the product and making it grow, but because of the success of that, there was um, a company out of Denver um, called Orange Glow International, and it was Max Apple was the founder, he was the dad, and Joel Apple was 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 the son, and um, they actually had called us repeatedly to to work to try and work with them, mm. and would come up at the day they always laugh about it. It's like because I kept telling them no, I can't do it. I'm working with a cleaning product. I can't take yours. And it turned out the cleaning product they had was OxyClean and Orange Glow. Yeah. And I kept telling them no because from an ethics standpoint, I was already doing one. And yeah. finally, I asked the other people I was working with, and it was kind of even though they're both cleaning products, they said it was okay to work work with them. So I said okay, we did. And they had somebody who. Um, uh, was doing their sales on HSN at the time, and actually, a lot of people don't know this, but they they their original product was a wood cleaner called Orange Glow. That's why the name of the company was Orange Glow, and it was based. It was a, a lemon, uh, no orange, uh, or orange oil, like you, you know, lemon pledge. There's yeah. an oil in in citrus peel that's really effective for cleaning and polishing yeah. wood. It's so natural, they they yeah. made a product line uh, based. It was a wood polish, and they had a guy selling it on HSN. 
uh, named Billy Mays, and he he would get on the air and he would do really well. Yeah. And um, so they said, okay, we're coming out with this new product, OxyClean, and um, Billy's had some success selling it on TV on on HSN. Uh, we want you guys to do a show, and so we made the very first infomercial with with Billy Mays wow. and uh, did kind of the the famous demo where you have the big tank of water and it's brown and you put the oxyclean right. in and it turns color and um, that was basically a basic chemical reaction. Mm. With, uh, but visually, it it showed how the product worked. Yeah. So, what was the growth? What did you do when you uh, worked with Orange Glow OxyClean? Yeah. Well, that was the same one. They were they were probably they were doing uh, sales in two areas on HSN and they were doing live pitches at like, um, you know, farmer's market or, or, you, you know, just different things like that. And they, and they were only doing a couple million dollars in sales when we made the first OxyClean infomercial. And that one had a very similar, um, growth similar to the Sonic care. Um, they eventually, I think in, in five or six years got up to 200 million in sales wow. uh, very, very quickly. And they were really good. Again, a good example of a man different type of management team. This was a family business, but really smart. Um, Joel had uh, worked for, uh, was a brand manager for Quaker Oats, I think. Uh, and he was doing uh, the marketing. Their older brother, David Apple, was a um, consultant for McKinsey. So, and their dad was just a serial entrepreneur um, that they weren't, they didn't, hadn't had any big successes, but he'd always like running small businesses. And it was, and it was really, it remained a family business and they, they didn't bring in, you know, top level management. They were very hands on themselves. Mm -hmm. And that was fun to work with those, with those guys through that process. A uh, little bit different management approach. That was one where a family just took it and was able to, to grow it. And that one had a good, good exit too. They sold their company to Church and Dwight, which um, uh, owns Arm and Hammer, and uh, and uh, I think it was either two hundred and thirty or two hundred and fifty yeah. million dollars uh, uh, on that on that particular yeah. one. So it yeah. seemed like they were having some success, and they had got on some networks. Um, when you started working with them, were you just did you just put an infomercial together, and what yeah, was the, this what was the was strategy? Uh, you know, some are easier than others. Um, this one was fairly easy. You know, was people people sometimes take, a, a, I guess, more success than they do. But, you know, here's a guy, Billy Mays, who already knew how to sell the product and was already successful at it. He had success on HSN. Right. He would go around and, you know, he could be one-on-one -on -one and he, you know, and, and, and sell you whatever product he was. He, he was with the classic, what they call a boardwalk pitch man, yeah. where you walk by their booth and you've seen him at state fairs and things like that. And so the key here really was to just capture his magic on, on, on TV. He already knew the pitch and then you just had to make the cleaning demos, uh, uh you know, um, come across, but let Billy do his thing. And so we would sit down and have how this one, we'd sit in a room with Billy and Joel and say, okay, what do we want to show? Well, we want to show a stain on a carpet. We want to show laundry. We want to show uh, a, a pet stain. And, you know, all you brainstorm, all the common stains that someone would do and then how OxyClean could help. And they were really good at bundling together. Like if they, they were selling OxyClean, they'd include Orange Glow. And then they also came up with a tub and tile cleaner called Kaboom. And, you know, you go into any store today and you see the whole product line you see orange glow you see kaboom you see oxyclean all of these came from that one company and sometimes it's fun for me to walk through like a bed bath and beyond or mm -hmm. really any store and you just see oh there's the the juicer and there's the blender and there's the sonicare and there's the kaboom and the oxyclean and it's just fun to see all those products out there knowing how they all started so what was it like working with billy mays oh uh, billy was great um he he was just a fun anybody you talk to just a fun guy to be around um uh really knew his stuff just booming voice kind of always the life of the party um just just w one of a kind type type of guy and it was just uh, always fun to work with him because it really made our job really easy uh when you were you literally had to just turn on the camera and capture his personality right. is and really again it, it was one where 
growing their business wasn't necessarily easy, again, because it's a fast-growing business, but the marketing part, because of somebody like Billy Mays, made it made it easy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and that's something you look for sometimes. It's like, um, okay, with Sonicare, there isn't a pitch person who, you know, who's the spokesperson? Um, George Foreman turned out, he, he wasn't really a pitch person. He eventually developed into that role. With Billy, it was, it was really easy that he did that. But that's one of the things that we struggle with sometimes is, not struggle, but try to figure out, okay, um, here's a product. Who are you going to pair up with it that's really genuine that can come across? And sometimes you don't. Sometimes it's you let the product be the star. Sometimes you put a celebrity. Sometimes there is a spokesperson yeah. for it. So those are kind of really cr crucial strategic decisions you have to make sometimes depending on who the product, you know, the product and, and who the spokesperson is. Yeah. And you work closely with Billy Mays. What do you think gave him some of that magic? Uh, it's hard. You know, it's interesting because I've been around, Jay Cordich had that magic for juicing. Yeah. And when you say the magic and both of them, that I'll tell you the background that both had them that, that was exactly identical yeah. is they basically lived out of their car and made their living selling whatever product in, in the case of Jay he was selling juicers he believed in it he lived the lifestyle but his background was he would go to state fairs to little health food stores and really day in day out um, you know the old kind of he wasn't a door-to-door -door salesman and he could just captivate he had a magic where he could captivate captivate whoever he was talking to Billy Mays had that same thing and it really came from uh, really doing that basic one-on-one uh, -on -one sales with the consumer, or one-on-three, or one-on-five, or one-on-ten, and another person I've never worked with them. Uh, you know that if you read any books by Ron Popeil, sure, that of course, he yeah. you know would work in the big uh, Marshall Fields in downtown Chicago selling products. So yeah. they all had that magic ability to connect with the consumer, but really. It was constant. It was they. They were professionals at their at their craft, which was whatever product they were doing. They knew they knew how to sell it, and they learned not not by reading a book, but by constant um, consumer feedback, which we talked about the last time. You know, one of the big things is when you're selling. If you don't make a sale, it means you said something wrong, or did something wrong, or didn't answer a question. Mm -hmm. And these guys were able to refine their pitches day in day out because if they didn't, they didn't eat. And right. so eventually they got really it's good. A big at motivator. Yeah. And yeah. so really it's, and if you look at that really basic element, those are the kind of things you need to look at when you're starting a, to market a, a product. You, you need to look at these guys and yes, they had good personalities, but they're not like overnight sensations. Every one of them, you know, beat the bushes, put in the time and the work and the effort and mm -hmm. became good salesmen by getting that direct feedback from the consumer. Yeah. So what were the big challenges then with OxyClean? Because it, again, seems almost like a fairy tale, too good to be true. Yeah, Just that, um, trying to think, there, you know, on that particular one, it'll just sound, it'll sound funny to you. And whenever, whenever you have a business growing that fast, there's mm -hmm. normal challenges and things like that. But from a marketing perspective, I mean, literally, we, this wasn't where we did one, like Sonicare, we did one show and changed it. With Billy Mays, we we probably did 15 or 16 half-hour infomercials. He would focus on one product. We'd make a new one. They We would do a lot of short-form spots. So really what we were doing during this time is because he was so good at what he did, they would they, the company would invent the new products. Like I was talking about Kaboom, Tub and Tile Cleaner. Mm -hmm. And that's got an interesting story. I mean um, the name of the product was Kaboom, which kind of is a catchy name. But they first launched it. it they were going to launch it. It was right after 9-11. Oh, and, geez. Yeah, exactly. And so it wasn't – they actually delayed the launch of that for about six months because of because of that – that just one of those yeah, weird – didn't want to be insensitive, yeah. It, exactly, exactly. Um, but that one, you know, it's sometimes – sometimes our job's easy. And in this case, I, I, it wasn't easy – for the Apple family to grow the company as big as they did, that's always challenging, that fast growth. But from a marketing perspective, with a person like Billy Mays, he was 100% focused on the OxyClean line of products. Afterwards, after they sold the company, that's when you started to see Billy selling everything. You, you know, he was just, people would hire him. He was a hired gun. 
And but when we were working with him for 10 years, he was 100 percent focused on the OxyClean line of products. Mm -hmm. And you could just uh, spend a day with him, figure out what you want, the cleaning demos, what you want to do, turn on the camera, edit it together. And you had something that worked. And it was because of because of him yeah. and good products. At the end of the day, I've mentioned this before. You can't. None of these companies would grow if the product didn't deliver what you claimed it did because there's an element to this where, again, it's the word of mouth. Someone gets it. They tell their neighbor. They love using it. And that's where the snowball momentum comes from. So, again, you can't sell – uh, build a big company around a bad product. Yeah. So like, at the end of the day, the products were really good and the the pitch guy was really good. Yeah. So, I mean, Billy Mays has a lot of great one-liners. What are some of your favorites? Oh, um, well, the, the, I think that goes to the very first one and we should, got a uh, pi picture of a waterfall because his, uh, one for me, the, the, the very first one with the OxyClean, um, I, powered by the air you breathe and the and the, and the water and the yeah so I, the water you drink or something like yeah, that, yeah. Water you drink, exactly and yeah. so doing that we we showed like again we showed a, we zoomed in and we got a picture a, a video footage of a big waterfall and zoomed in on that and just you know created a really clean nice thing but there also was a tiny bit of science behind that because oxyclean basically um was an oxy oxygenated cleaner and you know, you used that again some science there to mm -hmm. to on on how that particular product worked. But that that was my favorite saying of his. But he had a ton of them, and that was what he was famous for uh, was um, you know those one liners and making the different rhymes and things. And that was his his mo. And um, I don't even remember most of them. But he would always like sometimes just come up with them just to, just to, in the course of doing the um, you know the 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 pitch. All of a sudden, he would change the um, script and just say what came out of it, and, and it would rhyme, and it would be really catchy. <laughs> and, I, and obviously, there's some sales technique to that, right. which I really haven't explored using more. Um, that it, it's almost like a jingle. You know how you know they have jingles. Well, his some of his one-liners and phrases were very memorable, and mm -hmm. people would would remember it. Yeah. So when did GoPro come into the the picture? Well, we. Um, um, and we had a couple, uh, you know, uh, not a couple, uh, you know, w again, being in marketing, we we're having some success. So a couple little ones, we got into a golf category, did something called a momentous swing trainer that that was a one, one man operation. A guy named Jim Sorensen went from zero to 30 million in sales. Wow. And it was just basically, he was a golf trainer. Uh, it was a piece of, uh, uh, rebar with a, with a th thing on the end. And he was a golf and it was just something that helped your golf swing. And that was one where we got into the golf category for the first time. Then uh, before the GoPro, just to, uh, getting there real quick, yeah. another product that was really good for us was was interesting was the Rug Doctor. And you see that you can see that in any yeah I've it, heard of Rug Doctor yeah locations. And if you notice something, whenever you go into the uh, like the grocery store, the hardware store, wherever the rental things are, you see red Rug Doctor units. And so. Um, they were a successful business. They were in 35,000 locations, 100% rentals. You could go and rent a rug doctor, somebody, you know, um, you, you know, just for cleaning your carpet yourself. So they um, were looking into or had the decision to say, okay, we want to try, instead of renting the units, we're going to continue our rental business, but we want to grow. We're going to try making a consumer product. And basically, the consumer product was identical to the rental unit, except it was blue. Same machine, hmm. but the ones you see on TV are blue. The ones at the rental are red. And their their rental business was flat for like five years. And and um, again, because it was a cleaning product, um, the CEO of the company, Tim Wall, who's a great guy, um, basically was interviewing three different companies and. I ended up um, basically going down and talking to him and saying, look, um, I was just I was bragging a little. I said, nobody knows more about cleaning products than I do and how to sell them. And I and I was able to win the account uh, because they were originally going to go with someone else. So anyway, um, we did that. And I, I it was a fun product to work with because instead of like using OxyClean and making a, it was a machine that did it. And we just basically just similar, very similar to weight loss. The marketing thing is. 
when you're doing the television marketing or videos online or whatever, it's the, it's the concept of the before and after, the weight loss. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, you got a dirty carpet mm -hmm. and you ran the, the, the uh, rug doctor over and it was clean and you just show different variations. Again, very similar to what I said with the OxyClean. Yeah. What we learned from that is, okay, we had to show a pet stain and, and you had to be realistic and that, this might sound a little gross, but you actually had to use, um, you had to go to a, a hunting store and they sell uh, either coyote urine or deer urine and oh, wow. the hunters use it to cover, oh, up, right, right. To cover up the scent and, and <laughs> you would buy that at a hunting store. You had to use that because if someone came back and said, well, that's not real urine you're cleaning up. Yes, it is. And, and so, we, I mean... Kind of weird, but some of the things we go through. <laughs> it's a dirty and, uh, part of the business. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Crayons and everything. But um, that was a product where, again, why I liked it was um, we. It was a. It was a time where we were able to really start leveraging the online marketing with the TV marketing, mm -hmm. and they they um, uh, really went. Uh, they had a successful rental business. We started doing the infomercials. Their rental business started taking off again. The TV went well. They went from zero to half a million dollars sales every month mm. online from from zero online sales and just it's kind of how the first the reason I wanted to mention is the first project we did we really tied the TV and the online and the retail mm. all together and that's kind of more of the model we use now yeah. for products going forward what they call multi-channel marketing or yeah. omni-channel marketing type of thing yeah so what did you do for them online that worked um we had a, a online marketing partner called Net Media out of Salt Lake City, and at that time, it's really, um, really simple. It was capturing, <laughs> leveraging the TV dollars, where you know, sending people to the landing page, and that just to be honest with you, from an online perspective, um, at that particular time, not not a huge amount, except just being able to capture, you know, really giving the people the option. The preference to order online versus versus, you know, through the eight hundred number, and it started out in our business where that would be like five percent of the sales. Now it's usually sixty or seventy percent wow. come online. So wow. just the buying buying habits change. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So then anyway, that then then now we can talk about GoPro. Yeah. So, so yeah. Uh, so so that GoPro was a fun, a fun uh, project. Obviously, it, it just because of the product and the how they find you. Um. So there's a guy named Nick Woodman who founded the company sure, and sure. His, his story is pretty well known. He, he, he started an internet company in the late nineties, uh, raised some investor money. It was a gaming idea. It went bankrupt, lost the investor money It really, you know, decided to take a year off and he was a surfer guy, traveled around the world and, uh, you know, looking surfing. Um, I think he was with his girlfriend he um, he wanted to he wanted to figure out he he was a surfer but he couldn't afford hiring a professional photographer to take pictures of him surfing and wanted to figure out a way to do it and basically you remember those um, Kodak cameras that came in the enclosed cases he figured out a way to strap it to his wrist and started taking pictures then he said hey this is this is a good idea if I like it maybe some of my other surf friends will like it and made a made his own camera over in China and 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 really the key to the GoPro initially wasn't the camera technology it was the mounting technology nobody had figured out that you can mount it on a surfboard and you can mount it on your wrist and you can mount it on a helmet and that that was the thing that set them apart initially now their camera technology obviously has caught up and took off but it was and so how we met him was um we just got a call one of those things said hey we have a um no, I'm sorry. This one was different. There's uh, 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 a guy that works in my company. I, I I don't know if we talked about this, but I was doing mountain climbing for a while just as a hobby. And I climbed Mount Rainier. And my guide up Mount Rainier was a guy named Tim O'Brien. And I really, you know, I, I watched people and listened to people. And he was great with, with working with people and the clients. And I asked him, I said, hey, if you ever stop guiding, give me a call. And you know, there's a place for you in, in uh, camp, in customer service, camp, whatever. So he did. He go. He got married, and he goes. Um, you know, I gotta settle down and have kids. I can't be a mountain guide now. So right. he called me, and and so Tim is is now uh, a partner in the company. Uh, but that's how I met him. But anyway, how, he. So so what he did, he was interested, obviously, in the outdoors. So he went to the outdoor show in Salt Lake City, 
And Nick Woodman had a Volkswagen bus and was selling GoPros out of the back of a Volkswagen. He didn't have a trade show booth. It just oh. that, that was he would drive the, the Volkswagen bus into the trade show. And Tim said, hey, this would be a really good idea. We could sell this on TV. And um, so um, probably about three weeks after the trade show, uh, we get a call. And Nick and his father, they lived in Southern California, flew up to Seattle. It turns out his dad had invested in a company called Olimar Golf, and they had been really successful using infomercials. So they were open to the idea, mm -hmm. but um, they they weren't along, far enough along to really do this yet. And they also didn't want, and we run into this all the time because, you know, even though that you could talked about some of the brands we've built with infomercials, there's still a negative connotation to a lot of people on infomercial because they see some of the cheaper ones and some of the wacky products. And so Nick was in that category where I don't want to hurt my brand by using an infomercial. What do you mean hurt your brand? Sonicare is a brand. You know what I mean? Just it, it, it works if you do it right. But it's funny, the, right. the psychology. So, But he didn't want to go, go down that, that road. But um, obviously the benefit of the um, GoPro camera is all the user-generated footage. And what came out of really the collaboration and talking to him was the concept of um, basically tagging the front of the commercial. And, you, you know, their, their commercials are kind of iconic. They all start the same way with the GoPro camera. And then you get the user generated footage um, and where they, they edited those together internally. And at the end, this was kind of key go to our website and and someone will win one of everything we make every day. So it was a huge, and this is kind of how, instead of selling the product directly through an 800 number, we never used an 800 number, it was all drive to the website and then they had really good web marketers that could convert those people into sales. And then it just became, they were really smart. They, um, you know, they, they secured, it became the hip, cool thing to do. And they really started out with the extreme athletes and they were giving away cameras. Everybody was posting, you know, YouTube videos. Yeah, it goes viral. Was, yeah. Yeah, where we didn't have a huge part of the marketing because so much of it was done, um, you know, by the users themselves and the, and the just really the one of the first products that really took advantage of the of the benefit of YouTube from a marketing standpoint and sharing and everybody was posting videos on Facebook and sharing and social media and, and that's how that one really grew like crazy and um, that one was the fastest growing of any of the products we talked about Go, GoPro beat all the all the records yeah. uh, type of thing but anyway it was really funny so before we launched the, the one thing that one of the things is uh, we had that initial meeting with Nick and his father they didn't really do anything for about uh, six months. Then Nick flew up and he uh, to Seattle and he said, "We're ready to start our 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 project." And I remember we went out to a a, a local uh, lunch place um, and he ordered some chili cheese fries and a beer and and really started telling me. And this is the the vision that this guy had. They were they were doing less than a million in sales, and he goes, "I'm going to build a billion dollar company." And this, and he said that at lunch over you know over chili cheese fries and a beer and and um and it's like wow what a vision and it's like but the guy had the passion and you really believed that he could accomplish what he 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 said he was going to do and and he did he, he he made it happen it was just it was just an amazing yeah. story and and our company was involved we were a tiny uh, you know we're not a big agency at all you know like like at the time I think we were eighteen people and um. GoPro started small and we placed all of every single ad you've ever seen on TV, our company placed for them. And, at, you know, as they started to grow, this happens all the time. They go, okay, we need uh, more services and you can provide. Or uh, Anyway, they brought in the largest ad agency in the world, Kara, that's got, you know, 30,000 employees. It's international, worldwide. But Nick was loyal and he, and he let us continue to buy the media, which is kind of most ad agencies, that's the bread and butter that they come in. Mm. And we continued to do that from day one. And one of the nice things about that product was putting together, um, you know, sponsorships for the X Games and we, our media buyers would do that. And then they never bought an actual Super Bowl commercial, but we were able to leverage and we would say, okay, we'll go to the top six markets and buy local time instead of a Super Bowl ad, we'll buy what they call local inserts. We did that in LA and New York and the different markets he wanted to reach. And we were able to get 80% of the Super Bowl coverage at about 30% of the price. Wow. So 
yeah, just kind of a media buying thing that we we were, did for him. So that must be amazing to see that at the time for that lunch. Did you think it was going to be a billion dollar company? No, I, I you know I um, no, I didn't. I'd be honest with you because but but you know. And so there's an example of a guy that just had a, the vision and made it made it happen, and and um, it, it it was just exciting to watch that every step along the way. And he's a really trying to be a really really smart, obviously entre- entrepreneur, and built mm-hmm. one of the most successful you know startup companies ever. I mean, it's just yeah. it's amazing. It's remarkable the growth yeah. there. So what you know, we talked a lot about the successes. You know, when I read about you online. It says most people are, have a 10% success rate or whatever it is, and you have a 70%. There's still yeah. that 30% that you know that aren't successful. What are yeah. some of the the ones that didn't work? Yeah, um, one example. I mean, there's a lot of them, obviously. And you know, one of the reasons for a high success rate is um, is really the front end analysis and screening, and 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 not just doing. We get a lot of people coming to us say, hey, "Can you market this?" And they want to give us money. And again, if I don't have a passion for the product, yeah. if I don't think it's good, I won't do it. Yeah. And there's a lot of products we could have done and taken money for, and I knew that they really wouldn't work. Right, like the bagel so, maker. Yeah, yeah. But there's other other um, situations out there where they said, "Okay, they're, you're not going to do it. I'm going to do it anyway." And and so there's a failure rate. And so we've always like uh, only only wanted to really be involved in products that we thought that we could build to you know to some of the successes we talked about and not everything th- that that happens with um, and so we do a lot of front-end analysis to to make sure it's something we want to work with the, the, the personal test you like it you don't like it um, and um, so failures um, you know there's a lot as many successes as we talked about um, you know, we probably have an equal amount of failures, but again, you learn you learn from them. And you know, one one good example. I don't know if I mentioned this before in the first part, but uh, right after we did the juicer, we were we were basically looking for a way to get people to eat healthier. And one of the products that made sense was a bread machine with healthy grains and healthy grain mixes. And we were going to sell the bread machine, but then people could make really healthy bread to eat at home instead of Wonder Bread or whatever. Right. And we could just never make that work. And the lesson I learned from that one was it. And again, it's kind of common sense now, but it really was a numbers thing. People, it was two things um, similar to the bagel thing. It, it was like. Um, uh, it was easy for people to go out and buy a loaf of bread, and it was only a niche market for people that really wanted to buy that. And then plus the numbers, the, I learned about the certain margins have to exist for products to be successful. If you wonder, you know, you look deeper into businesses, why is Starbucks successful? If you look at the margin between what that what a what one of their coffees cost and what they sell it to the public for. Any business that's successful usually has a nice margin built in, and mm-hmm. the same thing is true for any of the products that we've marketed and had success. But a lot of times, you 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 get approached that a product's really good, it solves a problem, it would be good. But if you do a financial analysis, we can never make this work because there isn't enough margin between what it costs you to make it and what we could sell it for. Right. And it's kind of common sense, but it's one of those things that you asked earlier. What's one of the things to look at? Look at the financial model because no matter how good a marketer you are, no matter how good the product is, if the margin isn't there you, you, to be successful, you can never make a product successful. And you know, we learned that lesson the hard way a few times with some products that we thought would be really good, and just the financial model didn't work. Mm-hmm. And you also wrote down, which I thought was interesting, uh, the TA sixty five. What was oh, that? Yeah. What was that? That's a really cool product. Um, that one is one where you're somewhat, and you're familiar with this and doing what you do, you're somewhat handcuffed. A product, you know um, anecdotally that a product works. Mm-hmm. You know there's science behind it. But from an advertising standpoint, you can't really make the claims mm-hmm. because uh, this isn't a big drug, you know, a big drug mm-hmm. company. They have to spend zillions of dollars on clinical trials and so TA65 falls in that category it's a product um, that's based on actually uh, some people that won the Nobel Prize on t- telomere research and the fact that um, I actually researched this at one point before you mentioned it oh really yeah because you see it on Amazon and you'll right. you'll, ex- you'll explain what it is but I saw there's this bottle of pills essentially 
and right. it's six hundred dollars. I'm like, right. what is this bottle of pills for six hundred dollars? So right. I actually called the company. I had them send me the research. So I actually looked through that. But so what? Yeah. Go ahead. No, so t- 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 tell me a little bit more about your your research and stuff because it, it's it's in- it's an interesting story. It's kind of like, like the Sonicare. You know, like it, you see a toothbrush for three dollars, and you see one that's one hundred fifty dollars. You see right. these. And I don't know. I mean, it, it's kind of promoted as like an anti-aging, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, everyone wants anti-aging type of stuff. And yeah, the fountain of youth. Everyone's been looking for the fountain of youth. Patients for ask me that stuff all the time. And mm-hmm. and so I saw it and it was like, I don't know, five or six hundred dollars. So yeah. I'm like, there's obviously something to this of. Other companies are charging whatever. There's antioxidants you could buy for fifteen dollars, and then there's right. something for six hundred dollars. Obviously, there's something backing this up that allows them to charge that. And yeah, so, and at the time, this they were selling on Amazon, but before that, they marketed only through um, doctors, and and they would go the way they started that product was they TA sixty five. They would go to long. There's longevity conferences around the country, and they'd go and they'd have a booth, and they would basically sell it to the doctors and the doctors would um, not prescribe it because it's not a prescription drug, but ba- basically recommend it. Uh, recommend it. Yeah. And, and, um, and that's how they built that business up originally before they started to go direct to consumer. But the idea, the science behind it is really that there was, uh, you know, the Nobel, I forget the people who did it, but there was a Nobel prize awarded to the te- uh, uh, telomere research where the reason you age and grow old is your telomeres start to 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 shrink or or and um basically this product they had shown that it could actually increase or slow down the the um the 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 reduction in the telomere or the size of the telomere which then if you if you connect the dots theoretically should help you live longer and um the problem is connecting the dots so you can't mm-hmm. so the problem with this product was anecdotally people and it was a relatively new product so we did obviously didn't have a lot of long-term information but this is what the company founders were telling us this is what they were saying and it, and I'm not sure of the actual ingredients that was kind of secret but uh, uh, I think there were some Chinese herbs in it that um, and um, you know they basically if you could go on TV and say from a scientific standpoint here's why you age this will slow down the aging process. Mm. It would be the biggest seller ever. The right. problem is you can't do that because the FTC and FDA would get upset. Right. You know, you're making a drug cl- a, a drug claim. So it was a very challenging product to do. You kind of had to talk about, again, educate people about the telomeres and then in a way try to say that this. Make the you know, connection for them. Yeah, that it- without making a health claim. Yeah. And, uh, so that was that was challenging, and that was one where it it never uh, we could never make the story good enough to make the product work really well. But it was interesting. It was one of those ones where, like you, like you were like interested. I was like, this is really interesting. I, I and that was one that I I wanted. I was really interested in and uh, wanted to work on just to learn more about the the science of that. Yeah. So when when you worked with them, did it work at all? Just. It- you know, were they getting some traction or no traction? How did it end you know, up going? You know, I think um, it's it's interesting. And again, this is the way, again, we're just being honest about business right now. Yeah. Um, you know that there's certain health products that do really well in multi-level marketing um, or network marketing. And the reason they do is they circumvent the advertising process and the health claims and if you're doing network marketing, you and I are just talking over the dinner table and I can say whatever I, you want. You're not supposed to, but yeah. you can kind of tell a, a story about a product. And so that's why they were marketing it through the doctors. And and these were doctors. They read the science. They they read the clinical studies they had. And they believed that the, that the product really would have a benefit to their, their patients. And that's mm-hmm. why they recommended it. Um, so the, this product, I think, is, is a good product. People that took it liked it. It was way too expensive for the average person. Really expensive, yeah. Yeah, there's no way that that can be a mass consumer product at that cost. So what you have have was you were really marketing it to this uh, elite level of wealthy people that that wanted to get the benefits. So 
we tried reducing the price a little bit, but this is one where it's an interesting thing in psychology. Just what you said, it's like there must be something to this product. It costs six hundred dollars. Right. We tried to sell it for ninety nine dollars. What's not magic anymore? It right. really, and, that, and that's one of the things that happened. Regardless of the story, it's like, well, this isn't anything special, and um, it, it's it's an interesting, um, you know, look into human psychology. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like it, there's a certain, and so they started. They're still going, and they're doing well. I think, obviously, in anti aging. I think that we started working with them three or four years ago. So you really need like 20 years of history to see if this stuff really works. Right. And yes. Stan Summers helped make it popular because she had a book about anti-aging and she gets on all the talk shows and she was recommending TA65 as something yeah. that she would take. But it's kind of, it's new and it's like, okay, um, the science makes sense, but you need, uh, in this case, you really do need long-term results and it's just too new a product. Mm-hmm. Did but you actually, time. did you ever take it? I never did. I was so curious. In the the reason I heard about it was I was watching some health video on YouTube with uh, one of the he kind of talks about health a lot, David Wolf, and he yeah. mentioned in an interview that the only scientifically researched something was TA sixty five. I'm like, what's this TA? That's a pretty bold statement to make. Yeah. And so I, then I started doing research on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, they need to do a lot more clinical clinical trials. And again, for a small company it's it's not one where they raised a huge amount of money they they um it's it's an on, a, a small entrepreneurial company you know that's one i mean hopefully it, it would be a, it would be a good product like that but you know i do know enough about it to know that there isn't the magic ingredient is are things and there's a there's a special combination but it is based on some chinese herbs that are readily available for less price. Right. Is what I'll say about right, it. Right, right. I mean, I'm almost I was almost curious enough to buy it, so yeah. not quite. Oh, yeah. No, they 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 it'll be interesting to see what happens with that company. We're currently not working with them right now. You know, we yeah. actually I shouldn't say that. We um it's funny you brought that up because we we had stopped working with them for a year. They got a new marketing person that came in. They contacted us, and we just started running the infomercial again. Yeah. Um, so we'll see what happens with that. Yeah. Okay. It sounds yeah. interesting. Yeah. So, Rick, you know, I asked this, you know, it's Inspired Insider, and I always ask, what's been the lowest moment, and then how you push through those tough times? Um, I've had a, a, a couple um, when in the late, 80s before I moved out to Seattle I uh when I got to my start with that real estate guy I got into a legal battle with him and I had didn't have much resources and I had to declare bankruptcy and um I I when I moved to Seattle I was um I basically came out here with two suitcases I had borrowed money against from my mom to help fight some of these legal battles I was fifty thousand dollars in debt and came out to Seattle and like wasn't didn't have a job wasn't working a profession and kind of just started from scratch and that that was a a, a a pretty low low time um that sounds really painful yeah yeah it, it, it was and um um you know it was just you know you're you're actually in a position where um at that point fa- you know failure is not an option and you just have to do whatever you need to do to start um you know making life better and um so that that was that was one one point and then i uh another point for me what was was, your mindset at the time when you go back to that time because you say you just have to do it but that's sometimes easier said than done what was your mindset that allowed you to do that yeah we talked in the first part of the interview that i was really big in reading um motivational books and success books and i've always been a very optimistic person and Mm -hmm. the glass is half full not half empty and even then i just knew that i i could be successful and and i think there's a turn you know you can hit a point where you can you can give up okay and um you know let life take its course for me i just stayed i you know for me I just would read about other people's success. I would read motivational books and and positive thinking, I guess, is is and you hear a lot about that, but just really that type of optimistic outlook, positive thinking. Um 
you know, I've since learned that a lot of times things are cyclical, you know, there's going to be ups and downs. I think, I'm, uh, you know, one of the favorite sayings I had from a mentor, you know, things are never as good as they seem and things are never as bad as they seem. And, um, you know, I just knew that um, I had an inner belief that things would get better and yeah. that I could help make them get get better. Yeah. So, And you're about to mention there was another one. Another yeah, another, another one was more, um, I've always, um, you know, been involved in health. I've always eaten healthy. And, um, but you know, my, my dad passed away when he was relatively young, 45 years old, but he had a bad lifestyle. He smoked two packs of camels a day, yeah. ate a lot of red meat, had lots of stress. Um, and, and he had to, you know, like a lot of people at that time died of cardiac, uh, heart attack, cardiac. Yeah, sorry to hear that. Yeah. Really careful about my health and, um, you know, would always go get my cholesterol checked, ate really healthy. I, I for a a long period. I was a vegetarian for, for a long period. I'm not right now, but you know, just was really, really focused on health. So one day I, I would always get a yearly screening uh, and I went and got this um, plaque screening where you're fully clothed, you lay on a table and they do, you know, they run something over you. And, um, I remember I was eating dinner and I get a call and it was a doctor that had kind of worked with this thing. And he goes, well, I need to talk to you. There, there's something we found that, um, is unusual. We need to do some more tests. So I came back in. It turned out I had a um, aneurysm on my Whoa. ascending aorta. Holy cow! That was five point five millimeters in diameter. You know, like if you picture a garden hose and it's the big bubble. Yeah. And they call it the um, I don't know the 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 silent killer. If that bursts, you're dead. Yeah. Yeah. Exact, exactly. And so the 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 protocol at the time was. Mine was at 5.5, and and it was like, okay, the, the the way you fix this is open heart surgery, which has risks in itself. Sure, so they would sure. monitor it and say, okay, if it looks like it's growing rapidly, we have to operate right away. Okay. And if it gets to a certain size, and you know there's you know 5.8 or five, whatever, we you know we should operate because there's a risk of it, you know, um, carrying ballooning over. out, yeah, yeah, ballooning out, and so. We, I actually monitored it for a year, but I was really frustrated because I, here I am, I lead a really healthy lifestyle, everything's yeah. going good, and a doctor was saying, you know, this could be genetic, there's lots of reasons that cause it. So I had to, this was like uh, three years ago, I had to go in and um, have open heart surgery where they, you know, the, the main, you know, they, wow. the big thing, pull your chest open, oh. and, and so it, it, you know, they fixed the problem, it turned out they fixed that, and then um, put a new heart valve in. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. Oh, I've all this stuff, and it and it turned out that might might have been the cause of it was they said I was born with a bicuspid valve, uh, in in and so that might have helped cause it. There was and a so, genetic but, thing going. Yeah. On. The amazing thing was, um, you know, when the surgery was done, the recovery period again, it was a low thing. Whenever you're, you know, if you're an active person and you're that you you you're out of it for like six weeks. I mean, it's and the hard time. part, is when, you know, the chest part is healing because. <sighs> They, they, they crack open your ribs and that's the painful part. The internal part, all the work they do on your heart, that's good from day, you know, from immediately. And that's, you know, there's a little bit of healing, but there's no pain involved in that. So you're kind of bedridden. And yeah, they it, saw it, you. I mean, they saw you open. Exactly. They they basically take your, your chest cavity and your oh. ribs and go like this. And that's what yeah. they do is they, they and then they sew that all back together. It's kind of painful. Um, yes. But that, that was kind of another low point just because. Um, but really, it makes you look at life too, and it's like you know, life is is short, and yeah. you know, go do the things you want to do yeah. because you never you never know. Um, it's it's you know, recognize that life is short and it could be taken away at any time. Yeah. You know. So what did you change after that? Realizing that I mean, you just um, had your chest cavity cracked open, and you know. Yeah, um, it, it's interesting. I I did kind of change work a little bit, um, kind of made the company a little smaller, just, just wanted to basically freed up some more time. Cause I, I really enjoy, you can tell I enjoy what I do. I lo love doing this, but it, it, I was working a lot, but that's not, not the, what caused me to get sick. I mean, right. I don't, I don't think there was a connection there, but, um, but I did realize that I didn't, you know, need to slow down a little bit and just really smaller, little smaller company just um more more time to do some of the things mm -hmm. you know hobbies and different things i like mm -hmm. to like to do i like to travel and things like yeah. that so um that's the that's the yeah. biggest yeah well biggest thank change. god first of all you lived healthy because it probably would have been worse and second oh, yeah. that you had the testing done that they found it before it, oh, yeah. it burst so what's been the proudest moment um 
I guess the, the proudest moment, I mean, there's, I, you know, there's a personal side and yeah. the business side, you know, the uh, personal side is really just watching uh, my daughter, Anna, grow up and, and she graduated from University of Washington last year and she's over in Uganda right now uh, doing? doing some uh, uh, service work, building schools and houses and wow. things like that and helping with the malaria program. And I think that's kind of what she wants to do for a living is do kind of uh, relief work and mission work like that type of thing. And and so it's been great um, uh, watching her grow up. And and on the business side, it's like. Um, and then before on the personal, you've climbed some major mountains. Oh, that yeah, that was kind of just a hobby. And I uh, again, I got into it because remember the I well, I was doing it. Um, the, if you live in Seattle, it's an outdoor culture, and you know REI stores here, and you wake up every morning and you see Mount Rainier. And some people, it's like they could care less. For me, I, I when I first moved to Seattle. I would look out the window and I'd see that someday I'm going to climb that, you know, just because right. it's there, you know what I mean? I, you know, and, um, and it took me a few years to get around to doing it, but then I did and I kind of got bit by, um, a climbing bug and wanted to do it more and more. And that became a hobby. And my goal was actually, and this was before I had the open heart surgery. And so I, I had this, I didn't know I had this condition. Um, and I think it affected obviously my health somewhat with a leaky valve like that. And I didn't know it at the time, but, um, I, my goal was to, there was something where if you were into mountain climbing, you could do what they call the seven summits and it's the highest mountain on each continent. Oh, wow. And it, that would include Mount Everest. And wow. so I started to do that. And, um, uh, um, I went over to Russia and climbed Mount Elbrus, which is the highest, uh, mountain on the European continent. And, um, I had a trip to Kilimanjaro. I was going to do that. Would be the highest mountain on in the African continent. And then the the one that was and I, I'd climbed a lot of other smaller mountains in the Northwest and the Grand Tetons and the highest mountains in Mexico, which get up to nineteen thousand feet. Volcano, all most of them volcanoes. And then um, I, you know, for me the the big one that I climbed was Mount McKinley in Alaska, and that was a really uh, interesting. It was a three week like an expedition. Sounds and you dangerous. Kind of to get yeah to get prepared for something like Mount Everest yeah. or whatever, and um, and then coming down from them is that's when I kind of found out I had the health issue. Not there was no, it didn't bother me on the mountain. I made it to the top, but um, once I the thing happened with my heart, it kind of derailed the mountain climbing thing. But that was kind of a, a hobby that I did for probably about five or six years. Wow. Um, and I actually I did um, the, when we climbed Mount Rainier for the first time, we did it with Joel Apple from the OxyClean. Oh wow. Type, type thing yeah so that was uh because he was in who's from colorado and he was into hiking and climbing and wanted to do it so that was a fun thing so yeah. on the professional side what's been proud moment you know i i um to me just if you look at all the ones i've done and everything else yeah. i still have the best memories of the juice man business because um I feel like it not only was an area that I was interested in, we built a successful business, but I really felt like we really helped change the way people look at their diet, uh, a lot of people. I mean, back then, we weren't the original juicing people, but it did start a huge, I mean, if you look around at juicing now, yeah. it's, it's everywhere. I mean, it's like, you know, it's more bottled juices, you know, fresh, fresh cold pressed juices, but it's everywhere. And I think that one for me was my favorite because it was the first really big success, but I also was, um, it was my product. It was the owner, you know, the owner of the company. I wasn't doing it for someone else. And it was a category that I just loved and continue to love. I mean, yeah. anything that has to do with health and nutrition, I'm, I'm always interested in. So that, that yeah. was to me the, my, you know, the one I'm my favorite, I would say. Yeah. Rick, this has been absolutely fantastic. Um, tell people, where they should go to check you out. What are you okay. working on lately? Yeah, so anyway, um, really interesting thing we're working on now, but um, I'll tell you in a second, but you can go to our website, which is uh, cesaridirect.com, yeah. C-E-S-A-R-I, direct.com. Yeah. And uh, there's a way of getting in contact with us right on the, on the website. You can see some of the projects we talked about. Yeah. But also, um, so we're working some for some fun projects. So anyway, we... Um, are d just finished an infomercial with um, Dr. Phil's wife, Robin McGraw. It's a skincare line. But their son, Jay, uh, Jay McGraw, he's the executive producer for the show called The Doctors that sure. you see on TV. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so 
we he he's interested. He read my book and he's interested in direct marketing. He's really entrepreneurial guy. And they're coming out with and we're working on ads and running them right now. Uh, a startup company called Doctor on Demand, hmm. and it's an app that you can download on your phone, and you don't have to have insurance. And um, there's different um, offers, but the basic is for forty dollars, anyone could call up and talk to a doctor, an, an MD, for um, fifteen minutes, and they have the ability to prescribe over the phone certain medications like antibiotics, mm. you know, different ones. And there's different categories. And what I want to do, my my thing is I want to, that's going to be very successful. There was just a, a headline out that uh, Richard Branson invested in the company. And it's going to be huge because it's kind of the future of where yeah. I think it's going to go. It may be very accessible health care. Yeah. What I want to bring to the table yeah. is the natural part of that Uh, uh naturopathic doctors and chiropractic doctors to be able to give people that option of being able to call up and and do that type of medicine in addition to the to the regular doctor so it's one where the it's exciting because the technology is now available healthcare is changing i think it's going to be a a wave of the future and it's it's going it's a fun one to again another one fun one to to, to, to work on it that helps people and benefits people. Yeah, and people definitely need to check out the book, uh, Buy Now, also. Yeah, like, I listen, like I said, three to six books per week, and I told someone, like, when I first read or listened to it, this, I've listened to it three times already, and uh, it's definitely one of my favorites of all time. And oh, that's great. Thank yeah, you for I'm not just saying that because you're in front of me. I, What's that? You told me when we first talked that you had three or four or a couple ideas for new books. I have some titles written down of your future books. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'll have to share those with you. Okay. I would love. I would love to. Because I to took notes as I'm, you know, I list try and listen at the computer so I can take notes uh, on right. it. And uh, yeah, I definitely have a lot of notes and a lot of ideas for a lot of future future books. If that's what the route you want to go. Um, so my last question, Rick, is. What's some of the craziest things that have come across your desk? You probably get so many ideas and people oh, pitching yeah. you. Some of the crazy things and maybe some of the things you passed on that you wish, well, wish you would You know, have. part of the fun part of this, fun slash frustrating part of this business is dealing with inventors because inventors right. are unique people. And I don't know if you've had that experience. They, they, um, they always think that they have the next GoPro and no matter what the product is and, and, um, and they're, you know, very uh, a lot of times very protective they think it's like the next big seller i mean huge huge you know success and some of them are really weird things so two of them that i re that i remember and like you said i i get a lot of them but um somebody and it's always a red flag to me when someone calls or emails and they're very secretive and i got this great product and you know i i i, I want to share it with you but i don't want you to steal the idea and i go i don't steal ideas you know and and then you know we can sign a non-disclosure so we went through this whole process with this guy and basically he sent us uh i go can you set we signed a non-disclosure can you send us a prototype he wouldn't tell us what it was and i i get open up a box and there's a hanger with two um, uh, clothespins on it. And I go, what, what's this thing? And he goes, well, it's a new way for um, doctors to look at x-rays. And he goes, I, I'm an x-ray technician. And I think this will, I mean, it's really, I mean, believe it, that's really silly. I mean, I just, like some of the stuff you get. Then, then there was one where, um, I forget the name of it, but again, it was an inventor. And it was a device that automatically raised and lowered the toilet seat which obviously is a common problem and you think it would sell really well but it was it functionally it didn't really work but it was again it was just a, a weird thing and those are kind of like to me like that would be like a gimmick product that i don't can't really get behind but it was mm -hmm. just amusing then then one of the funniest was um uh these two guys called our office and they um were talking to us and um they had a product, and again, they were wanted to tell us about it. And it turned out they were hunters, and they were calling from Minnesota. And um, they had a product called, uh, you know, what's the name of it? And it's, it's called Seasoned Shot. And I go, what's what's that? So they go, well, what we've done is we've taken shotgun shells, and instead of pellets, we've put in, in like, um, uh, spices. 
And so when you actually shoot the, the bird, they're already spiced up. And they, this is a real product. And and uh, that was one of the fun. I mean, and they were 100%. Sometimes, like you just laugh. Sometimes it's like you just want to laugh at some of the stuff you hear. But they, they you know, it, it's just seasoned shot. And I think they actually. It's got a good name, actually. Yeah, you can actually find it at some hunting stores now. But they, you know, can we make a commercial for this? People will buy it. And I go, I don't think I'm interested in, in doing that. But that that's a pretty, pretty funny one. Uh, Any yeah. that you wish that anyone that you passed on that you wish you wouldn't have? Yeah. Um, let me think about that. There, there have been um, def, definitely. I'm just I'm just drawing a blank right now. Like I, yesterday. I, like to think about them probably because it was like oh it was a good opportunity right. not so much from making a money standpoint but just you know a fun product to 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 market i'm gonna have to get back to you on like, that one like an interesting like i talked to uh yesterday i interviewed nolan bushnell founder yeah. of atari oh, yeah. and he, we were talking about he got offered a third of apple for 50 oh, yeah, for fifty thousand dollars and yeah. passed it up yep um uh, yeah that uh uh so and I've had oper well, you know, oper opportunity. Yeah, that that's one. That's the probably. I'm sure the, there's I'm some like that for you that somewhere. I don't know if it was in Steve Jobs' book or I remember reading that. Story. Walter Isaacson, maybe maybe the biography. Oh, yeah, exactly. But he confirmed it. It's true. Yeah, he said he passed it up. You know? That must have been fascinating to talk to talk. To. I mean, some of the people you talk to, it's it's just it's great it must be really really fascinating for you it is it's amazing as i figured there's got to be any common threads common threads Do you see any yeah i mean like um you know a lot of times when i'm interviewing people and things like that again it, it has to be in a certain subject but you interview a lot of successful people um any commonality or things you see and or is it just a lot of differences and, uh, you know I, you know that's a good question. The some of the commonalities I see are kind of what you say—that positive outlook and that perseverance. Yeah. You know, they yeah. no matter what, they'll just—they're so confident, and yes. that's why that's why I always ask the question: How do you know whether to kill an idea or keep going with it? Because a lot of the successful people, they're just pushing through. Like you said, you go yeah. bankrupt. You you know you don't hear yeah, about well, those it's, challenges. It's the old Will Rogers saying, you know. Um, if you're in a hole, if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. You, you know what I mean? But then you balance that with, okay, you know, never give up. And, and, and I think that you can have, and, and a lot of times you read about um, entrepreneurial people or hear about them that have spectacular failures and, you know, they won't give up until absolutely everything explodes. And sometimes that happens. Sometimes people are, fortunate that that doesn't happen but a lot of entrepreneurs have that in their background like i told you about nick woodman and you know his first internet company just blowing mm -hmm. up and he lost like four million dollars of investor money and um it, you know everyone i think a lot of successful entrepreneurs have that in their background that they really don't give up and the market forces them you know to 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 stop but but then they don't give up they go okay what's the next idea right and that is it's almost uh, relieving in a way yeah because exactly. and that's why i like to ask about those challenges and those mistakes because we only hear about the big successes we oh, don't yeah, hear absolutely. about the things that didn't go well or we don't hear about you know i went bankrupt i had two suitcases and i had to borrow money from my mom that that's actually motivating you know yeah. people like i was yeah. here and i just persevered and built it back up to to what it is now yeah it's it's yeah it's very you know the more you you talk to people you probably see this too um there's very few like overnight successes. People usually pay their dues. Yes. And then something becomes a big success, but it mm -hmm. isn't just right out of the the can like that. Yes. And that yeah. is what we he, we what that's what the media I think portrays a lot of times is it just yeah, overnight success, but Billy Mays was doing all of those shows okay. and in just Jake practicing Ford, the same pitch. thing those yeah. guys spent years and years and years yeah. on the fair circuit you know pitching and like i said in health food stores paid their dues and then then when the time was right they yeah. capitalized on it that's so. what i love to hear that's this your yeah. stories you know that's what i love to hear and that's what people i think um you know love to listen to so rick i really appreciate it you know thank you so much again for for part two yeah, it's been fun. Um, I look forward to uh, hearing back the interview. The the interview. So 
Yeah, it'll be great. Thank you, Thanks Rick. Good experience. Fantastic. All right, bye now.